Hi, I'm Moon, and one of my favourite things to do is write a review for literally every single thing that I read or watch. Another favourite activity of mine is to share the things that I love, so what better option do I have than to make a video about all of the things that I've read and watched in the year of our Lord 2023? So welcome to the first instalment of my annual media wrap-up where I'll take you through all of the books, movies, mangas, animes, and fan fictions that I've gotten through this year. This is going to be a long one, so make sure that you have a comfy spot and all of the snacks that you need, or that this video is playing at a good volume so you can go off and do whatever while you listen to me ramble for probably over an hour. I'm not one to judge, I do it too, okay? But before you leave, please make sure that you like this video and subscribe to my channel. I always feel so cringe saying that, but like... What else am I going to say? <laughs> All of my socials are also in the description below and the very first link will take you to my Notion where you can see all of the reviews that I'm talking about in this video. I'll get more into that later. Now I know that some of you will only be interested in certain aspects of this video so I will provide you with timestamps soon but first let me show you how my review system works. I review everything on my Notion which is publicly accessible by the way so you can see everything that I'm working on and reading or watching and you can also copy the templates if you want to start your own review system as well. When I finish reading or watching something, I will start off by noting down the work's title, artist, media type, and genre. Then I'll note down other relevant statistics like the number of pages in a book or the number of episodes in an anime. And finally, I write the review, and that includes not one, but two star rating systems. So first is your typical five star rating system. So media with one star are the worst things that I've ever had the misfortune to lay my eyes on. Meanwhile, media with five stars are simply the best of the best. So you'll notice that if you scroll through my review page, I have a lot of four and five star ratings. This is because I'm not the kind of person to push myself to finish something if I really hate it, and I'm also super duper picky with what I start reading, which means that it's really rare for me to rate something three stars or below. And because I have so many really highly rated stories, I wanted there to be a way for me to figure out what were the ones that really moved me, what were the best of the five stars. So I created the gold star rating, which is is very simple, you either have a gold star or you don't. If you see something with a gold star rating, it means that this story literally changed my life, but if it doesn't have a gold star rating, that doesn't necessarily mean anything. It could mean that it's still really good, it just wasn't the absolute best. So let's see how my statistics from then compare to now. Okay, so last year I watched four movies totaling 444 minutes, five TV shows totaling 40 episodes, and 15 animes totaling to 341 episodes. And as for things I read, I managed to get through five mangas totaling 810 chapters, seven books totaling 1,995 pages, and... <laughs> 104 fan fictions coming to 2,846,206 words. Meanwhile, this year I've watched 10 movies totaling to 1,225 minutes, 7 TV shows totaling 125 episodes, and 16 animes with 258 episodes. I've also read 5 mangas totaling 226 chapters, 15 books totaling 3,999 pages, that one page, and 32 fan fictions coming up to 679,656 words. There's still a little bit of time left in this year, so these numbers aren't absolute yet, but they're a pretty good indication of where my stats are going to end up this year. Now I'm going to work through all of these respective media types in chronological order. Here are the timestamps for anyone who is interested. I'm going to start talking about books, then manga and fan fiction, so all of the reading is in one place. Then I'm going to talk about movies, TV shows, and anime, so all of the things that I've watched in one place as well. I feel like I've talked for so long and I've barely even started. I'm sorry, let's get into the books. When I was a kid all the way through to, I want to say about 16 years old, I could not go anywhere without a book in my hand. I was reading literally all the time. Every waking moment, if I could avoid doing anything else, I was reading. And when it came to VCE and getting into uni and all of that, I was too stressed to do it, and now I've kind of just lost my mojo. I can't do it as much as I used to anymore. And that's why at the start of this year I set myself a goal to read at least 12 books. I figured one per month. That's pretty doable, right? And it is. I did it. As well as using Notion, I like to track all of my books and manga volumes on the story graph, which is like Goodreads if it's slave. And the fun part about the story graph, aside from having an actually functional website and app, is that you can track literally everything imaginable to do with books. You can track your average rating and the average number of pages that you read in a book. 
You can track your favourite authors and genres. You can track the kind of format that you read the most. You can look at a glance and see what time of year you read the most, whether it's the highest number of books or the highest number of pages, whatever. It also has this really neat feature where you can log tags and potential trigger warnings without spoiling what actually happens in the book. And if you didn't finish a book but you want to know what percentage you read, you just type in the page number that you DNF'd at and it will tell you automatically. These are my statistics for this year and as you can see, if you count manga volumes, I've technically read 27 books this year. A majority were medium paced books with 8 slow paced books and 7 fast paced books. Most were less than 300 pages, I did read a lot of light novels this year, but there were 6 that were between 300 and 499 pages long. I read one non-fiction book while the rest was fiction, my average rating is 4.8 stars, and I read the most books in September, exactly 11, totaling 1,972 pages. This year I only DNF'd two books, and I'll talk about why in a minute, but let's start with the very first book that I read this year. Between the Lives. This book is one that one of my best friends gave me for my birthday and it took me so long to actually get around to reading it. I felt awful, but it was actually really good. Please do not let the Wattpad cover fool you, okay? This one made me cry a lot. And my friend annotated it when she gave it to me, but she didn't tell me what the different highlight colours meant, which meant that I had to go around and figure out what themes they represented. It was so much fun. It was so much fun. I loved it a lot. This book tells the story of Sabine, who shifts between alternate universes every 24 hours. So in one universe Sabine lives in Wellesley with a really rich family, she's got perfect grades, perfect friends, everything's looking really bright for the future. And in the other universe, Roxbury, she's got a pretty normal life and normal family, but of course she meets the love of her life in this universe. Things really start to go wrong for Sabine when she reveals in her Roxbury life that she shifts between these alternate universes, and of course they just think she's insane, so she gets thrown into a psych ward. And she realises that she's struggling to shift between each universe, so she has to make a decision about which one she's going to stay in. I ended up reading this book 4 out of 5 stars. It definitely would have got a gold star if I read it when I was like 16. The concept is really unique, and what I really liked about it is that the two universes were not portrayed as perfect. Her more comfortable life had this thread of discontent woven through the entire thing, while her less glamorous life felt very much like home. If you're into young adult fantasy, especially if it incorporates magical realism, I cannot recommend this book enough. Even if you're just looking for something a little bit different, please read it, it's so good. Next we have The Poems of Nakahara Chuya, which of course I rated 5 out of 5 and gave a gold star. Chuya's poetry is really famous for its song-like flow and beautiful imagery, and when I tell you this translation delivered, even though it had to sort of give up on the flow or the song-like quality of the poems, they were still so incredible. And it's kind of crazy how well I can relate to these poems when some of them are nearly a hundred years old at this stage. Even the ones that I didn't fully understand or resonate with at first had at least one line that really struck me. And the further I investigate them, the more I analyse them, the more I love everything in this book. The one thing that really struck me is that he is so good at somehow putting into words these really big and raw emotions that I've never been able to describe before. When I was reviewing this, I wrote this might be the collection that reignites my adoration for poetry, and that is so true. There are poems in here that I literally think about every day. They are my Roman Empire, but also it pushed me to go back and look at the old poems that I used to really like and seek out new ones as well. When this collection features heavily in the poetry analysis video that I promised you guys is coming, don't be surprised. Don't be surprised. Next, I read She Who Became the Sun. I cannot believe how long it took me to get around to reading this because it was incredible. She Who Became a Son begins in a famine-stricken village where a young girl watches her brother be told his fate. He is told that he is destined for greatness, and when she asks for her fate, the seer tells her that she is destined for nothing. But a group of bandits come through and kill her father, and eventually her brother as well, and so she decides to steal his fate, and she lives in his stead. This I also rated 5 out of 5 and gave a gold star. Once I picked this up, I couldn't put it down, and when I had to, I just could not stop thinking about it. Because not only does this provide a fantastic discussion on ideas of fate, diasporic identity, gender, sexuality, but it also mixes together two of my favourite genres of all time, 
historical fantasy, and magical realism. The plot is insane, and the characters are beautifully well-rounded, and if you see an analysis video from me about this in the future, do not be surprised. I'm actually annotating it currently, I've only done chapter one, but it's so good. Next is Little Fires Everywhere, which I do not own because I've been trying to go to libraries before I actually buy books which is difficult, but I'm doing it. The story of Little Fires Everywhere begins when Mia and her young daughter Pearl move to Shaker Heights, which is this quaint, perfect little suburb in Cleveland. Mia and Pearl's lives begin to be intertwined with the Richardsons, who are a very well-off, old-money family within this suburb. But Mia and Elena Richardson are torn apart when an infamous custody battle takes over all the news in the town, and Elena becomes obsessed with uncovering Mia's past. This one's prize surprise was also rated 5 out of 5, and given a gold star. This was the first novel that I ever read by Celeste Ung, and it was a really great introduction into her writing style and the topics that she usually covers within her stories. She usually approaches ideas of family and love and home, but from slightly different perspectives with every novel, and she's really amazing at threading these really intricate themes super subtly throughout the entire work. And at the end of my review for this one, I said, this book left me feeling gutted and vulnerably wide open like a fire had ripped through. And that was so true, but also so poetic, oh my god. <laughs> Next I read volume 3 and 4 of the Bongo Stray Dogs light novels, so that's The Untold Origins of the Detective Agency and 55 Minutes, and you should know by now that these are of course the best things ever for me, it's my favourite story of all time, shouldn't be surprising, they both got a gold star. Untold Origins tells exactly what you would expect it to, the story of how Rompo and Fukuzawa met and eventually created the armed detective agency. And 55 Minutes tells of the ADA being sent on a case to Standard Island, which is a floating city, but once they arrive there they realise that things aren't exactly what they seem. Untold Origins is interesting because it gives us a beautiful insight into Fukuzawa's thought process and how he doubted himself so much before he became the leader of the ADA. Meanwhile, 55 Minutes is genuinely unlike anything I've ever read, and unlike any other part of BSD, it was so gripping. I felt like I was reading a thriller for the entire time. This one plays around a lot with time, obviously, it's in the title, and this is one of the few light novels that we have from Atsushi's perspective, which I'm not mad about because the entire canon storyline is about Atsushi and it tells things from his perspective, but it's just really interesting to read his thoughts in a different format. I also love this one because it gives us an insight into how the agency operates when they're not fighting for their life against the Port Mafia or the Guild. Now we come to the first book that I did not finish this year, and this is The Art of Prophecy by Wesley Chu. Let me read you the synopsis for this one. It has been foretold, a child who will rise to defeat the Eternal Khan, a cruel immortal god king, and save the kingdom. The hero, Jian, who has been raised since birth in luxury and splendor, celebrated before he has won a single battle. But the prophecy is wrong. I went into this super excited. I had read a couple of Wesley Chu's works when he worked with Cassandra Clare before. I thought that the premise was amazing, the cover art was absolutely beautiful, and I thought to myself, if I enjoy this book, I get to buy it, because I borrowed it from a library, and put it on my shelf, and it's gonna look so pretty on my shelf, but I was just so disappointed. I have two pieces of criticism about this book that aren't just it annoyed me, which is like the major reason that I ended up putting it down. The first is that the dialogue is just like really weirdly written. It took me until about chapter 7 or 8 to realise that the dialogue is actually really bad, mostly because at the beginning of the novel, leading up to then, there wasn't much dialogue. It was all action with really short snippets, short sentences, or sometimes the character would have an inner monologue, and I could kind of forgive that for being a little weirdly written, because I was like, yeah, they're thinking to themselves, they're not going to be thinking the same way that they speak, but I should have taken that as a red flag because the dialogue was awful. Okay, I could not give you an example, so I found a photo that I took of one of the bits of dialogue. I'm really sorry. It felt like a serrated blade burrowing through flesh, bone, and spirit, Sally's lips curled. The pull didn't guide me so much as drag me unwillingly. I lost complete control of my body after that. No sooner had the initial pain subsided than this strange compulsion emerged from the festering wound. It burned like a deep hunger and a mental compass, like an invisible leash, and it began to force march me toward the sanctuary of the eternal moor in the Black City. 
who speaks like that? <laughs> I just, it's, mm. there were also a couple of bits of dialogue that I felt had them acting totally out of character. Like when the main character, Jan, says, but I want to stay with you. Please don't leave me. Everyone else in my life has. You're the only person I have left. I just felt like he wouldn't say that. Even in that moment, he wouldn't explicitly go out of his way to say, everyone else in my life has left me. Please don't leave me. Oh, it's nitpicky. I know it's nitpicky. I'm sorry. The only other major issue that I have with this book, which is quite a big issue if you want to put it like that, is that one page I felt like I had absolutely no idea what was going on, and the next it was like everything was being mansplained to me. It felt like he couldn't make up his mind as to whether or not he wanted to trust his audience was smart enough to keep up with what was happening. And on one hand I get it because this genre, like the high fantasy genre, tends to be really overwhelming. Reading the first few pages is like reading a totally different language half the time. But the point of a high fantasy is that as the story goes along, the author will feed the audience little tidbits of information so that they can take all of these new words and concepts and settle them in their brain and understand what's happening. We don't have to be spoon-fed like we were within this story, but we do need to just be guided. Like a trail of breadcrumbs is usually all it takes. I realise that I'm probably coming across as very angry or aggravated, you could say. Uh, I'm just so disappointed. It's really just disappointment. And so for The Art of Prophecy, I only rated it 2 out of 5 stars. It is not the only rating that is this low. Even though that was really disappointing, I was very quickly saved by the next book that I read, which was Everything I Never Told You. The way that this book begins is a really great indicator of how gripping the story is, despite the fact that it's not a thriller or anything of that kind. On the very first page, it says Lydia is dead, but they don't know this yet. Huh? So of course this one also got 5 out of 5 and a gold star. You're starting to see a pattern here. Everything that I said about Celeste mm, earlier definitely applies to this story as well, but I think that this one, it just moved me in a way that Little Fires didn't, so it's just a slight step above that story. Now we have arrived at the second book that I did not finish this year, and that is Notes on an Execution. Now to be absolutely fair, I think I was too harsh in my criticism of this book, and I do want to try reading it again with a bit more of an open mind, but when I went into it, I just wasn't having it, and that's mostly on me. I'll read you the synopsis for this one as well. Ansel Packer is scheduled to die in 12 hours. He knows what he's done, and now awaits execution, the same chilling fate he forced on those girls years ago. But Ansel doesn't want to die. He wants to be celebrated, understood. He hoped it wouldn't end like this, not for him. This is a work of literary suspense that deconstructs the story of a serial killer on death row, told primarily through the eyes of the women in his life. So cool! The reason that I rated this so low, because I also gave this two stars, one for each chapter that I ended up reading, is that every second chapter was told in second person, which I personally do not like. <laughs> but I understand why it was told like this, I understand the thought process behind it, and I'm willing to give this book another go when I'm feeling much more patient and open-minded, but it was just, it was not for me. Next up we have The Immoralist, which is a super tiny classic. If you're looking to get into classics, I do recommend this one. And I did only rate it two and a half stars out of five, but I didn't think that it was bad, if that makes sense. I know those are two like completely opposite thought processes, but hear me out. This story follows a young man who is trying to figure out what love is. He has no idea how to receive it or how to give it, he just knows that he's supposed to love people and he can't figure out how. He ends up marrying this young girl, Marceline, out of duty to his father, and he feels guilty about this, he knows that he should love her, but he can't figure out how. Now despite this story being a modern classic, it didn't really read like a classic, it was quite a quick one for me to get through. And the main character, who I'm going to call Mikkel, but I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right, was equally frank but elusive, and that was quite frustrating for me. I couldn't figure out whether I wanted to trust him, and you, that's amazing writing, right? But it was just, ugh, so annoying. I noticed throughout the story that he always claimed to be providing us the story in the most straightforward manner that he could, but he was constantly dancing around the subject every single time. It didn't matter what it was, he would find a way to be elusive about it. And while this was frustrating, it gave the writing 
an overall feeling of being very human, and I really enjoyed it. Next is a book that I'm sure everyone was reading this year, and it is also the only biography that I've ever enjoyed as much as I did, and that is I'm Glad My Mum Died by Jeanette McCurdy. Now, I am really not a fan of biographies, which is the only reason that this one didn't get five stars, because it was so well written. And what's interesting is that it was truly horrific in some parts, but also really wistful overall, and it's just, it's this kind of feeling that you can only get when you're reading a biography or when you're looking back on your life or someone else's life. It's kind of horrifying now to look back at all of the things that Jeanette has done against her will, essentially, and how even though she looked like she was having so much fun doing it, you know, she was just acting the entire time. My heart went out to her so many times as I was reading this, and I can't imagine how equally terrifying and gratifying it must have felt for her to publish this novel. Next we have the novel that I'm sure most of you are very familiar with by now. If you want a full analysis on it, I have a video already on my YouTube, That Novel Is No Longer Human by Osama Dazai. You may be surprised to know that this was not rated five stars for me, even though it is probably my favourite book ever. It does get a gold star. I only rated it 4.25. And I think a big reason for this is because I've analysed it so much. It's been annotated within an inch of its life, and there's just so much that you can pick up on when you go back a million times. But I also have this new version that is a modern translation by a totally different translator, and I am so excited to read it. And now that I've read the novel properly so many times at this stage, I want to go back and reread the manga as well. There is also a special edition hardcover that I want to buy. I don't think you can own too many copies of your favourite book, honestly. I'm kind of collecting them. I'm not going to speak too much on this book because I've already spoken so much about it, but just know that this, along with one other novel, is my favourite story of all time. Next is possibly my favourite short story collection ever, that is Salt Slow by Julia Armfeld. This is only a really small book and it took me a day to get through. It was incredible. Five out of five gold star for this one. All of these stories were strangely uncanny in a really difficult to describe, sort of uncomfortable way, but I could not tear my eyes away from the page. I was sucked in the minute that I opened that book. In my initial review, I wrote that it's uncomfortable in a way that is really difficult to describe, and the best sort of example that I could give was it's like looking in a mirror and not recognizing the person that you see. Deeply unsettling but not in like a jump scare kind of way, you know what I mean? I know that I have like a book collecting problem, I buy far too many, but this is one that the second that I finished it, because again I borrowed it, I looked at it and I was like, I need to own this. I need this on my shelf right now, I need everyone to know that I've read it so they know that I'm better than them. Next up I borrowed two short story collections from my library again, both of these were Japanese short stories. So the first was a collection by Atakawa Donosuke, and the second was a collection by a mix of authors, both of these books were amazing because they included stories that are actually really hard to get your hands on if you want an English translation. I actually went out and bought this book the other day. I haven't read everything yet. It's by a totally different translator, but it's a collection of short stories by Artagua, and most of them are the same ones that I read in that initial collection. One of the translators, in their note at the beginning of one of Artagua's short stories, I can't remember which one, noted that he has a particular genius for the macabre. And that so perfectly puts into words the way that he writes. Often his stories were subtly horrific, and that just makes them so interesting to read. And that makes all of his short stories, even the ones that are simple retellings of folklore, really gripping and difficult to put down. A lot of the time I found them to be strangely moving as well. I would put down the book and just have to stare at the wall for a couple of minutes because I couldn't deal with it. Now with the other short story collection, Modern Japanese Lit, I was running out of time for my library loan so I could only read some select stories before I had to give it back, and these are the authors that I read. Higuchi Ichio, Kunikita Dopo, Natsume Soseki, Tayama Katai, Mori Ogai, Izumi Kyoka, Akutagawa Renosuke, Tanazaki Janichiro, Dazai Osamo, and Yosano Akiko. And of those authors, three stories and two poems really stood out to me. The first was Higuchi's short story Growing Up. This one I found interesting because she managed to introduce 
such a wide cast of characters and make me care for them so deeply that I cried by the end of the story. It was so beautiful and really, really bittersweet. The second story was by Katai and that is One Soldier. This one was like a tragedy that had been steeped for a really long time in anti-war sentiment. And it's really difficult for me to explain how I was feeling at the end of this story. It was just... Mm. And the final story that really stuck out to me was a snippet from Tanazaki's Light Snow and they called this the Firefly Hunt. And this one was just so nostalgic and it felt like a dream. When I put it down I was kind of shocked that it was over. And the two poems that I really liked were unnamed. One was by Natsume and the other was by Yosuno. I'll put them up on the screen so you can pause and read them if you would like. We're almost at the end. We have two books left to go through. The first of those is one that I could talk about for ages. It is called Power by Naomi Alderman. This one got a 5 out of 5 and a gold star rating and I know that it's kind of polarizing. People either love it or they hate it and I want to talk about why I loved it so much. The power begins in a world as we know it. Everything is exactly like it is today. But one day, women and girls start waking up everywhere, all over the world, with the ability to conduct electricity through their hand. They have this magical muscle in their shoulder called a skein, and they use this in order to gain power. And the reason that I think this story is so polarizing is because it's speculative fiction. It kind of takes this idea of what if women were so much more powerful than men and runs with it. And it goes in a direction that I think a lot of people aren't really expecting. The main criticism that I see of this story is that if women were to rise to power like this, they would not act the way that the characters do in the book. And I 100% agree with this. I think that this is a very valid criticism, but I think that people who say this have kind of slightly missed the point on what Naomi Alderman was trying to do. And I'm sure most people have heard at some point that matriarchal societies, even though they're very rare, exist in a very different way to how patriarchal societies do. And what the power essentially does is it creates a matriarchy but they act the way that a patriarchy does. And I think that was the point, just to switch the roles. It's not to give us a genuine insight into what would happen if one day we woke up and we were in a matriarchy. But the reason that I really like that she's just switched the roles and hasn't given us a more sort of nuanced take is that it exposes what so many women view as normal, what so many people in general view as normal. You know, in this story, in this universe, all of a sudden, men are worried to walk alone at night. They're worried that they're being followed by the strange woman down the street. They don't know how to say no. They're too afraid to do anything. It's very eye-opening. And on one hand, of course, you feel really terrible for these characters. But on the other, it's a feeling of almost pettiness. Like, yeah, it sucks, doesn't it? Imagine having to live like that. Imagine having to go through that. What really drove this home for me, what really made me understand that this is what she was trying to do, is the letters at the beginning and the end of the novel and the diagrams between each chapter. When I read the first letter at the start of the novel with no idea of what I was getting into, I was like, hmm, that's weird. I wonder what this could possibly mean. But at the end, it's very clear that this is set hundreds of years into the future, long after women have risen to power. And this young male historian is writing to his female professor and he's saying, I really hope that people will accept this story. It's just a historical fiction. I've tried to create characters as well as I can. And his professor is writing back to him in a really patronizing way. Do I say patronizing? matronizing maybe? I don't know, that feels weird. If I can find the photos that I took, I'll put them up on the screen and you just have to pause to read because you will understand exactly what I'm saying. It just made me so angry. It filled me with a rage that I always have inside me at this stage, but I just think it's so well written. If you have a friend who's teetering on the border of feminism and hasn't quite taken that dive yet, get them to read this book because maybe Maybe it will help them to understand. And now we're on to the final novel that I read this year, and that is volume two of PSD Light Novels. This is Osamu Dazai and the Dark Era. The reason it took me so long to read the official translation of this book is because it was on back order everywhere and it finally arrived the other day. Anyone who's watched Bungo Stray Dog season two will know what this story depicts. It tells us about Dazai just before he left the Port Mafia for the Armed Detective Agency and what it was exactly that made him leave. I have read or watched versions of this story so many times and every single time I am guaranteed to 
absolutely bore my eyes out. It's so sad. But aside from that, I can't stop thinking about the thematic implications of all of these like tiny little throwaway lines throughout the story. It's just, it connects to everything. I know it and I just need the time to be able to prove it. Now, like I said at the start, the year is not yet over. There are a couple of books that I am currently reading and I will share those with you now. First we have Slaughterhouse-Five. This is the second novel that is my favourite story of all time. So Slaughterhouse-Five, No Longer Human, they're everything to me. This is actually the very first novel that I ever analysed back in high school in year 11 I think it was. So I'm going back through it now and I am re-annotating the entire thing and as I'm going I'm remembering exactly why I loved this story so much. It's really difficult for me to explain exactly what the story is about so I'm just gonna read the blurb to you. Prisoner of War, Optometrist, Time Traveller, these are the life roles of Billy Pilgrim, hero of this miraculously moving, bitter and funny story of innocence faced with apocalypse. Slaughterhouse-Five is one of the world's great anti-war books. Centering on the infamous firebombing of Dresden in the Second World War, Billy Pilgrim's Odyssey Through Time reflects the journey of our own fractured lives as we search for meaning in what we are afraid to know. I am very likely to write an analysis on this. Keep an eye out for it in the future. Now you'll know that I'm rereading and annotating She Who Became the Sun as well. I'm also doing that with Dazai Chu Year 15, which is volume 7 of the BSD light novels. I'm doing this one first purely so that I can do Stormbringer straight after, but I do eventually want to annotate all of the novels. And aside from that, there are also two books that I'm just reading at the moment. The first is Heaven Official's Blessing. I barely started volume 1, but I'm already like so hooked on the anime, so I need to read this soon. And the second is The Grandmaster of the Monic Cultivation, I'm up to volume 4 in this one. Now let's move on to talk about all the manga that I've read this year, and this section is much shorter, I am so sorry. <laughs> it feels like I didn't really read that much manga this year, but that's mostly because I've just been reading chapters as they come out. I have like five stories on the go right now. <laughs> These are the mangas that I completely finished this year though. First was Bongo Stray Dog's Beast. This is the same story that's depicted in volume 6 of the light novels, which is also called Beast, but it's just in a manga format. I've talked about this in other videos already but I'll just give you a quick refresher. Beast is based in an alternate universe with the same characters as Bongo Stray Dogs but the main difference is that Atsushi is in the Port Mafia and Akutagawa is in the Armed Detective Agency. And Akutagawa is currently hunting for his sister who was stolen by the Port Mafia and he can't figure out how to get her back. My favourite thing about the Beast manga is definitely the art style. I chose this volume because it's my favourite cover and it hurts so much. Just look at the inside cover. You're kidding. <laughs> Another thing that I really love about Beast is the thematic implications for the rest of the story. This is how we know that every alternate universe you could possibly imagine is technically canon within BSD, and that means that our universe, where all of these characters are based off of real authors, is technically also a part of the story. I don't know, I just think it's really cool. It's a neat little thing that Asagiri left in. I also caught up with Given, but I haven't completely finished the story because there is one final volume that is not available in English. Given tells the story of Yuenayama, who one day comes across Mafuyu with this really expensive guitar but no idea how to play it, and he eventually gets him to join his band. It's basically a slice of life. I don't know how else to explain it. It's really good. But volume 8 actually came to me the other day, and hold on, let me show you. Look at that. I, I lost it. This is still my favourite cover because Mafuyu is my son. I love him so much. Anyway, I already have a mini analysis about Given on my TikTok. In it, I talk about how these characters directly correlate with the instruments that they play. For example, Mafuyu and his inability to find his voice, and then once he does find it, he finally feels free. Or Akiko and Haruki being the percussionists of the band are like the steady heartbeat that keep everyone together. I might end up doing a proper analysis about this, but I feel like I've already talked about all that I want to on TikTok, so I'll link those videos if you guys want to go watch because I was quite proud of myself. I also finished reading the BSD Gaiden. There are only two volumes available in English at the moment, so I've read volume one and two. Um, I read the light novel, the unofficial translation, ages ago and I couldn't tell you what I thought about it because I can't remember. But once again, the art style in this one is amazing. I love that Asagiri took living authors instead of just dead classics authors and that they love this story as well. I'm in love with Tsujimura. One, like, 
no shame about it. I need to see more of her in every aspect of this story. Now, the Gaiden isn't an alternate universe, but a lot of people don't know about it because it tells the story of a completely different set of characters. It is still really good, though, and I still really recommend that you read it. Let me just quickly take you through the manga that I'm currently reading as well. There are three that I'm totally up to date on, and those are Chainsaw Man, Bongo Stray Dogs, and Jujutsu Kaisen. I read these online every time they come out. They hurt a lot, all of them. There are two that I'm currently reading, but I'm not up to date on any of them, so no spoilers, please. The first is Moriarty the Patriot, and the second is The Case Study of Vanitas, both of which I love very dearly. I also want to note that I'm up to date on Haikyuu and Attack on Titan, but there haven't been any new chapters recently, so just kind of ignoring them for now. Like I mentioned at the beginning, I have read 32 fanfictions this year, which is really, like, rookie numbers. Pretty pathetic for me, honestly. I blame that on the fact that I made a real concerted effort to try and read so many more books this year, and it's a trade-off that I'm willing to accept for now. Now, I'm not going through all of them, and you'll notice that I don't review all of them on my Notion either, because a majority stay between me and God, okay? However, there are some that are so good that they deserve to have praise sung from the rooftops, so these are the standouts that I read this year. The first is Threefold Fate by Devil Rin. This fic is based on Bungo Stray Dogs and it's about 60,000 words and it takes place just after the Mersault conflict. It's canon compliant if you squint and the writing is so beautiful. At the beginning of the story, word spreads that Chuya has handed in his resignation at the Port Mafia, so Dazai is like, why don't I do that too? And they retire together. Which sounds really sweet and wholesome, but this fic is anything but. It's really haunting in the most beautiful, positive way. It's terrible. <laughs> this is one that I talk about literally all the time on every social media, and it deserves to be talked about here as well. Go read it. Next is Empire of Dirt by Arkastat. If you've been in the Bongo Stray Dogs fandom for any amount of time, you've probably heard of this fic. It's infamous for its major character death, and it's 59,000 words, and I knew what I was getting into when I read it, but that didn't stop it from hurting so much. My next recommendation is Don't Hurt Me, I'm Tired by Hana Euphoria. This is a BSD fic once again, but this time it focuses on Shinsukoku. It's 14,000 words and the description says Akutagawa doesn't know how to touch anything without leaving bloodstains on it. That should give you an indication of the kind of prose that's written in this fic. I genuinely haven't stopped thinking about it since I read it. When did I bookmark this? The 5th of November can't stop thinking about it. Verging away from BSD a little bit, we have In Time, which is a haiku fic, and this one focuses on Bokuwaka. I fear I may be regressing, because if you look at any of the reviews from last year, you'll notice a vast majority of them are haiku. And this one's set in Bokuto's second and third year, and I just love how all of these characters were written. I think it was really well done. And this last one is one that I have loved for years. It's probably one of my favourite fics ever. It's a BTS fanfiction and it's called Kiss Me Hard Before You Go by 777335. It follows Yoongi and Hosok as they move into a terrible apartment together and it's one of the sweetest, most fantastic fics that I think I've ever read in my life. I'm so serious guys, this author is amazing. I want to tell you about a couple of past standouts as well because I feel like it would be a disservice to not mention them in this part. Sticking on the BTS theme, we have two fics that my friend wrote who's an amazing writer. The first is When the Moon Rises, which is Namsok. These two are my biases, so I just loved reading this fic so much. It was really sweet. And the second is You Make My Heart Do Triple Toe Loops, which is G Cook Ice Skating AU. Need I say more? No. It's perfect. I also have two haiku recs. The first is Insert Coin to Play by Fairy Cake. This is the Sakuatsu fanfiction that started everything for me. I became obsessed with them after this. It's 179,000 words. Seriously, genuinely one of the best pieces of fiction I've ever read in my life. It's an alternate universe cyberpunk AU. They're bounty hunters. It's so good, guys. It's so good. And we also have Find a Way Home by I Need My Girl. This, hold on. I actually ended up printing and attempting to bind this fan fiction. It's a really bad job because it's the first book bind I ever did, and I don't even own all the materials necessary to make a proper bind, but it's so good. And I have two more recs. Both are from Attack on Titan. Both are alternate universes and both are Eruri. <laughs> the first is Pledge by Ella Besmirch. I feel like if you're in the Attack on Titan fandom and you like Eruri, you can't avoid this fic. 
but it's amazing. If you have no idea, imagine Levi in a frat. Right? So good. Go read it. And my final wreck is Annihilation by Ajax the Great. This takes place in a post-apocalyptic universe, a different post-apocalyptic universe to Attack on Titan. This acid rain came and wiped out humanity, basically, and Owen and Levi survive. What could possibly happen? I could talk about fix for so long. I'm gonna stop. I'm gonna stop and we're gonna move on. Now let's move on to things that I've watched this year, starting with movies. The very first movie I watched this year was The Menu, and I watched that so early on in January that I was pretty much convinced while I was writing my script that I actually watched it in December of last year, but that's just not the case. If you haven't already seen or heard of The Menu, you're probably living under a rock. It's such a good movie. It's part dark comedy, part satire, and it follows the story of Margot, who attends an extremely expensive restaurant with her boyfriend, Tyler. And from the moment that they step onto the island, because of course the restaurant's on a private island, Margot senses that something is deeply wrong, but she just goes along with it because these are rich people doing rich people things, and rich people like things that are weird, right? It's pretty normal, right? It is not normal. It is not at all normal. I gave this movie a 5 out of 5 and a gold star, and what I really loved about it was the soundtrack, the pacing, and the characterization. They were all absolutely top-notch to me. I also loved that this story wasn't just about a class divide, it was also about the torment of an artist who's lost passion for everything, for the thing that he used to love. Next was Hidden Blade, which honestly I just watched because it has Wang Yubo in it. This is an espionage thriller which follows the story of a Chinese spy who is infiltrating the Japanese military in order to try and win World War II. Now war movies and spy movies, especially those depicting any of the world wars, really need to be watched with caution. Because obviously the country that that movie originates from is going to do its best to make that country look good and everyone else aside from them look bad. And I mention this because I know with this movie and the other Wang Yubo movie particularly, people are going to be like, it's obviously propaganda. I know, every war movie is propaganda. Let's move past that. If we consider it from a completely theatrical perspective, I loved it. It was really well done. I was on the edge of my seat the entire time, even when I didn't really understand what was going on. While we're on this topic, I'm going to skip ahead to the next one, Yibo movie I watched, which was Born to Fly. This one is, again, a war movie, but it's focused more on the military and less on espionage. And I'm not really one who regularly enjoys action movies, especially ones about war planes, but this one was really great because they focused more on the relationship that the soldiers had with each other than the actual fighting. I feel like that's just something that Asian movies tend to do better and focus on more than Western movies. I'm no expert, okay, I don't watch a lot of movies, but if you watch a Korean horror, for example, it's a very different thing to a Western horror. Western horror you can expect to not sleep for a week, Asian horror you can expect to not only not sleep for a week, but bawl your eyes out by the end of the movie. I'm going way off track. Anyway, Born to Fly overall was very fun. There was not a single dull moment in that entire movie. Next we have Bongo Stray Dog's Beast, the live action film. I was so happy when I finally got to see this one. I haven't talked about it on YouTube specifically, but on TikTok I have a couple of times. I think that the stage play actors, who are the people who acted in this movie as well, are so perfectly cast. They really did a fantastic job at choosing who was going to play which character. I also think that it's a really cool decision to have Beast represented as a live action movie rather than an animation, because it just drives home the idea that this is an alternate universe that we're talking about. Of course, being a movie, they had to cut out a couple of things in order to make everything fit within the runtime. I was really upset that they cut out the rice field scene with Kenji, because I think it's really important to understanding Arctugula's character. Because of the amount of scenes that they cut out, I was really surprised when they added a couple of scenes with Chuya, which I'm not mad about because Chuera is everything to me. But aside from that, I have no complaints. I think it was a really good adaptation. Even the CGI that I knew wasn't going to be great and it did have its pretty terrible moments turned out to be pretty good. I love how they animated Rashomon. I think that was really awesome. Next we have Trigun Badlands Rumble. I'm going to talk a lot more about Trigun and Trigun Stampede in the very near future, so hold on to that. But this movie was really fun because it takes the original Trigun 98 characters 
and it gives them a more modern adaptation. I was really disappointed with Vash's character though because for some reason in this movie they made him super misogynistic and it was just really off-putting, like that was not the same guy. And look, there were hints of misogyny in the original Trigun 98, of course, because it's an anime released in 1998, but I was willing to let it slide just because of how old the anime was and how typical that is in that time period. But like I said, it was just so out of character for Vash to be acting the way that he was, and it was a lot more palatable in Trigun 98 than it was in this movie. Aside from that, I really loved it. I loved Amelia. I wish that we could see more of her in new adaptations of Trigun, but I don't know how likely that's going to be. Next I saw Barbie, of course, which I gave a 4 out of 5. Initially it was a 5 out of 5, but I dropped it down to a 4 for one particular reason. This movie is really fun. It did not disappoint. I was really entertained the entire time that I watched it. And I knew that being a feminist movie, it was going to hurt, but I didn't expect it to be as existential as it was, and I left the theatre feeling really numb. But the one complaint that I have about it that I think lots of other people have had is that it was just entry-level feminism. It was the most basic beginner stuff that I've known since I was like 12. And I understand why they had to make it that way because the amount of backlash that it received was incredible. But I do wish that it could have been slightly more intersectional. And I find it really interesting that Ken, who was the antagonist of the story, was still so lovable and so good at heart. I think that he's a really good representation of young boys who end up getting lost in ideas of misogyny because they want to feel powerful and they don't know where else they belong. They feel as though they're not allowed to talk about their feelings and they feel trapped in this bubble and they end up hating women because of it. But I wish they could have expanded on that a little bit more. I love the way that Barbie still treated him with so much respect but still kept him at an arm's length towards the end of the movie. But overall it was a really good movie and it's been a while since I've watched it so I would like to see it again just to see whether my thoughts are still the same. Next was Suzume, which I also gave a 4 out of 5. A majority of that good rating is because of the animation and the soundtrack. They were so beautiful, I felt like I was totally lost in the scenery. The reason it loses a star is because I was really upset about what happened to Daijin. I think that he deserved so much more, and I don't know, it seemed really clear to me from the very beginning that all he wanted to do was help. All he wanted was to be Suzume's friend. He wanted to love her and have her accept him, but she couldn't even do that. And to see him looking so small and defeated made me cry. I cried so much in this damn movie. I cried more over the cat than I did the main character. I think another reason that it lost a star for me is because I wasn't expecting so much angst. If I'd gone in expecting to have my heart broken, Maybe I would have been more impressed, but I don't know. Next is Puss in Boots, The Last Wish, which got five stars and a gold star. I really loved this one. One of my favorite things that animation studios do is change the animation style in order to portray that something's different and the way that they lowered the frame rate anytime there was a fight was so cool. I ate that up. It was amazing. The wolf was also genuinely terrifying and I don't know if I would show that to a kid. Like maybe... A tween, a teen, I don't know, but a child? Mm, might be too much for them. And the final movie that I saw this year, I watched only a couple of days ago, was The Boy and the Heron. Wow, wow, it was so good. I'm just really thrilled that I got to see a Miyazaki film in cinemas. I didn't think that that would ever happen to me. And I've heard mixed reviews about this. Some people really love it, some people don't. Some people find it really hard to follow. Some people are disappointed that it's different from the rest of the Ghibli films, and I don't really blame them because it was very different, but to say that it's the worst of his films? No. No way. I'm not going to talk about it too much here because I really do want to do an analysis on it once I get to watch it again, but I really think that if you go into this film expecting that everything, especially the fantasy elements, are an extension of Mahito's self, how he thinks, and the trauma that he's recovering from, you're going to understand the film a lot more easily, and you're going to understand how well this links to the rest of the films that Miyazaki has created. Briefly, I want to tell you about the films that I rewatched this year, and speaking of Ghibli films, there are a lot in there. I rewatched House Moving Castle, Kiki's Delivery Service, Ponyo, and Castle in the Sky. Castle in the Sky is my favourite Ghibli film of all time. It still is, even after The Boy and the Heron, but I think The Boy and the Heron would be a close second. What both of these movies do really well 
is they talk a lot about grief and they talk a lot about identity and belonging. And they do so with these magical fantasy elements. Castle in the Sky, it's more magical realism, everyone's in on it, but Boy and the Heron, it's just Mahito. There's no indication that people outside of his fantasy world are actually there. I also rewatched Jujutsu Kaisen Zero, which is the only JJK movie out, and it's incredible. It follows the story of the second years, when they were in first year. I love Yuda, I love Sadasugu, and Inamaki is one of my favourite characters, so of course this is my favourite JJK adaptation to date. And I also rewatched Forgotten, which is a Korean thriller film. This was unlike anything that I was expecting. I truly did not know what I was getting into when I started this film. It's about a boy who comes home from university because he's been suffering from mild breakdowns and he's helping his family move into a new home when one day his older brother gets kidnapped. He has to try and figure out where his brother is, he's the only person who witnessed the kidnapping, but he feels as though something's really off. There's something wrong with the house, and there's something wrong with the people around him. When his brother comes back, he's acting really different, and he can't figure out why. And when I tell you that you have no idea what direction this movie is taking you, I, I can't tell you anymore because it would spoil everything, but it's so amazing. It's definitely my favourite thriller ever. Now let's move on to TV shows. All of these were really good, like only one of them was rated 4 out of 5, the rest were 5 out of 5, but only one of them changed the trajectory of my life, and that was The Untamed. I had never watched a Chinese drama before, much less a cultivation drama, and it's just a whole other world. For anyone who's unaware, the cultivation genre is kind of like the witches and wizards of Chinese fantasy. These characters practice cultivation, which is essentially magic, in order to strengthen their spiritual core in the hopes that they will ascend to godhood. The Untamed starts in the middle of the story when we learn that the feared demonic cultivator Wei Wuxian has died in a horrific way. But then over a decade later, he wakes up in a stranger's body. Someone has sacrificed their soul in order for the vengeful ghost of Wei Wuxian to overtake their body and enact vengeance for them. As you're watching this story and learning more about Wei Ying and who he is, you're wondering what could this guy possibly have done to make so many people hate him so much? But that is just one of the many mysteries that this story represents, and it's absolutely incredible. The only drawback of this story is sometimes the CGI is a bit goofy, but if you can look past that, it is literally perfect. Incredible storytelling. I cannot recommend it enough. The next TV show that I finished was You, Season 4. I don't know what it is about this story that just keeps me coming back. It's like watching a car wreck. I cannot look away, but I hate it so much. And You, for anyone who isn't aware, is a story about Joe Goldberg, who lives in New York initially, and this season he lives in London. Um, and he falls in love with this girl, and he stalks her, basically. He's really weird, he's a real creep, but something about the way that he's written makes you not want him to get caught, even though he's done some terrible things. Most of the other seasons I would rate 5 out of 5, but at this stage, like at season 4, I just want him dead. I want him dead, I want him gone, and it's so frustrating that he keeps getting away with it. But the way that everything falls into place is always really interesting and gripping. I, like, kudos to the authors for writing such a despicable character. Will I be watching another season of this if it comes out? Yes, because I can't look away and I just want this to end already. Next I watched The Days, which was like part documentary, part historical drama. It's based on the events of the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear meltdown in Japan. It tells the story of the plant workers who were on site at the time of the meltdown, all the way from the managing director to the kids who'd only been working there for a couple of months. Next I watched Heartbreak High, which of course I absolutely loved. It was so refreshing to see teen high school drama in an Australian context. I haven't watched one of those since I sat down to watch ABC after school. And I really loved how even the most despicable characters had a lovable streak. It made me want all of them to do really well in the future. And speaking of Australian shows, I binged the true crime documentary Last Stop Larimer. It covers a missing person case which took place in a tiny town called Larimer where there were only, I think it was, 11 residents? And one of them, one day, just went missing, and nobody has any idea where he went. As entertaining as this show was, it did leave me with a really bad taste in my mouth, and I won't talk too much about why because of spoilers, but yeah, it was really well done though. The final show that I watched was also a documentary. This was the La Seraphim documentary called The World Is My Oyster. I'm finally getting into this group. Every time that I've seen them perform anywhere, 
I've known that they're really cool and I wanted to start standing them and I finally took the leap. All of that aside though, this show did a really good job of showing us behind the scenes of idol training and it's absolutely brutal. I could never survive that and it's made me look at all of my favourite idols in a really different light. I know that a lot of you have seen Namjoon in the background by now. Um, yeah, it's just wow. It's totally different to see it with your own eyes than to just hear about it, you know? And for anyone wondering, my biases are Gunjin and Sakura. They're so cute. I'm not really watching any TV shows at the moment except for Midnight Gospel, which my friend recommended to me. I've only seen one episode and it was incredible. I love the animation style. It's so cool. I'm about to start watching Yellow Jackets. I've heard really good things about this show. And I need to rewatch season one of Sweet Home because season two just dropped unexpectedly and I haven't watched it in so long. I forgot everything that happened. And I'm really looking forward to the new season of Alice in Borderland as well. That show terrifies me. <laughs> Finally, we are at the moment that I'm sure most of you have been waiting for, unless you've skipped here, in which case, hi again. Let's talk about all of the animes and donghuas that I've watched this year. It should be totally unsurprising that the first donghua that I watched this year was Founder of Diabolism, which is just a retelling of the untamed in anime form. While I think that this is an excellent addition to Murdazushi, it's incredibly confusing and I would not recommend that you start out by watching this one. If you're going to start MDZS, watch The Untamed first. The Untamed does a really good job of pacing and showing you where everything actually lies in the timeline. The founder of Diabolism would just randomly jump around in time without giving any indication. The only indication that I had was that I already had an understanding of the timeline, so it was super confusing. But the animation was really good in The Founder of Diabolism. It made me sort of understand how cultivation magic is actually supposed to look, and it brought to the table the one thing that the untamed kind of lacked. That being said, I don't think that this Tonghua is a really good standalone piece. It's a perfect addition to MDZS, but if you were to watch that and nothing else, it kind of wouldn't be that great. Next, I watched Trigon Stampede and Kinda of the Great Snow Sea. They were kind of being released together, so every weekend I would watch an episode of each. I was really prepared to hate the animation of these because they were both a CGI kind of style, but I ended up really liking it. Trigon Stampede was my introduction to the Trigon franchise, as I'm sure it was for a lot of people, and it really did not disappoint. I love how the character designs were updated, and the animation ended up being one of the best parts of the show. Tristan follows the story of Meryl Strife, who is a rookie journalist looking for her breakthrough story when she stumbles across Vash the Stampede, who is a wanted criminal, but he doesn't act like a criminal. If anything, this guy is just kind of goofy. Against their better judgement, Meryl and her senior Roberto end up joining Vash as they try to figure out why Millions Knives, who is Vash's evil twin brother, is stealing plants from towns who need the plants to survive. Kinda of the Great Snow Sea is a similar kind of vibe, but also totally different to Tristamp. It follows the story of Kaina, who lives on the canopy of a dying tree. Kaina grows up hearing stories about people who live beneath the canopy, but he never has any indication that these people actually exist. Until one day, a princess floats to the top of the canopy and tells Kaina and the remainder of his people that she desperately needs help because the kingdom below is dying. If you like high fantasy and are looking for an anime to get into, this one is amazing, but it's only 11 episodes long, which was the one reason that this didn't get five stars. I had a really similar feeling to how I did in season one of Attack on Titan, which is like this story is so big and it's only just beginning and we don't really understand what's going on. The only other complaint that I have about this show is that the romantic subplot between Kaina and the princess, Luriha, was really forced, but I feel like that's just kind of a given for high fantasy. Anyway, I want nothing more than for a second season of this show. If it came out, I'm sure that it would be so good. Speaking of shows that I wish there was another season for, Buddy Daddies was incredible. If you've heard anything about this show, you would have heard people comparing it a lot to Spy Family, and it is a very similar concept, but it's also totally different. In both of these shows, two parents who happen to be very dangerous individuals end up adopting a child and trying to protect her 
from the terrors of the world. Both of these have elements of espionage and found family, but the biggest difference to me is that Spy Family is more about the espionage and Buddy Daddies is more about the found family. And because of this, Buddy Daddies is just slightly above Spy Family for me. I know people are going to be like shocked and outraged, but I don't care. I liked it just that little bit more. And it's only one season long. It's highly unlikely that we're ever going to get a second season. And I just have to move on with my life now. I have to forget it ever happened. This, of course, did get a gold star for me. I could watch it a million times and never get sick of it. Next was the original Trigun 98. My expectations were set really high by Trigun Stampede, and this show met them. I was prepared for the kind of awkward animation and characterization of older animes, but that didn't really happen. I truly never enjoyed an older style cartoon as much as I did Trigun 98, and this is the one that convinced me to read the manga, which I still haven't done, but I'll get around to it, I swear. Next was Demon Slayer Season 3. This got 4 out of 5 stars, much like the rest of the Demon Slayer franchise, because the characters are so good and lovable, the storyline is amazing, I love the animation, the over-sexualization of female characters is what always gets me. Now, we don't actually know whether the author of Demon Slayer is a man or a woman. I really hope that they're a woman, because that would kind of make the over-sexualization like, okay, they're meant to be overly sexualized, you're meant to look at them and feel uncomfortable. But we just don't know that yet, and it just, oh, it sets me on edge every time I watch it. That being said, Mitsuri, one chance. One chance. This season also dragged just a little bit in the last couple of episodes. I feel like the final battle could have been condensed far more than it was. But it was so frustrating because I was watching it week by week. To finish an episode after waiting for so long for it to come out, and not have moved any further in the story. It just felt like it was a little too much for me, but aside from that, loved it. As I was watching Demon Slayer, I was also watching Hell's Paradise, and that was just two completely different experiences. I knew that I was going to like Hell's Paradise because I like the other two of what people call the Dark Trio, so Chainsaw Man, Jujutsu Kaisen, Hell's Paradise. It was really amazing. I love Gabimaru so much, and similarly to Kaina, I just feel like I'm tilting on the precipice of something really big, and I'm not going to find out what that was for quite a while. The animation style was also really different to what you'd usually expect out of MAPPA, and I really liked that. I thought it was super cool. Then I did a total 180 and started watching Moriarty the Patriot, which is 5 out of 5 and a gold star, of course. It's a running joke that if you like Bungo Stray Dogs, you also have to like Moriarty the Patriot and the case study of Vanitas, and I understand because those three shows are just like god tier to me. MTP retells the story of Sherlock Holmes, but from the perspective of William James Moriarty. And it views the relationship between Moriarty and Sherlock more as one of rivals rather than enemies. I really, really like the character design in this one, and also what struck me when I started the anime is the way that it set the mood. There aren't a lot of animes that are able to so easily create a really eerie, gloomy atmosphere. Moriarty the Patriot did that from the very first opening sequence. And I know that a lot of people really don't like the anime because they read the manga first, which is exactly why I watched the anime first, so I could enjoy it for what it was, and now I'm reading the manga and understanding why people hate it. I kind of hate it too now. <laughs> but because it's so good as a standalone, it maintains its gold star. It deserves it. When I finished Moriarty the Patriot, I had a new anime recommended to me, and that was Bongo 2 Alchemist. I feel like not a lot of people have heard about this one, especially not BSD fans, so just let me introduce you to the concept here. It's very similar to Bungo Stray Dogs in that it's taken real life authors and personified them as the main characters of the story. But the difference is that these authors are now spirits of themselves and they come to life within one of their own novels that is being destroyed by an enemy that they call the Taint. The Taint's goal is to destroy all literature on Earth and so these authors have to fight them off by completing the story as it was. The issue is that they don't know who they are, they don't know what the story is, or how it's supposed to end. So what happens is other authors delve into their stories to try and help them fight off the taints and complete the story as it's meant to be. The main character in this one is Dazai Osamu himself, and what I love about this is that unlike BSD, where the characters' relationships are totally made up, 
The relationships within the story are very similar to how they were in real life. So the real Dazai Osamu actually really looked up to and idolised Akutagawa Donosuke, and that's exactly what happens in this story as well. This anime is only 13 episodes, but it was so fun, and it made me really fond of all of the characters. And it's also based off a game, which is Japanese, so unfortunately I can't get it, and even if I could... I wouldn't be able to play it because I can't read, but it was really cool to see how these creators approached a similar concept in a very different way. Shortly after that, I finished Junji Ito's series, Japanese Tales of the Macabre, and it was so cool to see his classic horror design animated. I'm not going to lie, when I read my first Junji Ito story, I was kind of disappointed because I knew that this guy wrote horror, but I wasn't really horrified by anything that I read. But the beauty of his work is that it's a lot more subtle. It's just meant to be, like this title suggests, macabre. It's meant to be something that you simply can't look away from, and maybe something that's going to haunt you as well. Definitely the best part of this series is that they did such a good job of animating the stories the same way that they were drawn initially. I really liked Junji Ito's art style, and also the intro sequence was so cool. Next I finished Bongo Stray Dogs season 4 and 5. Of course, you know me, you know how much I like this show, it got rated a 5 out of 5 with a gold star. This is all despite the minor changes that the animators always make with BSD, not even minor, sometimes they're really major and it's like, why? But it was so cool to finally see the hunting dogs and the decay of the angel animated, and honestly, I think that they did a really good job with these two seasons. When the final episode of season 5 came out, I don't think I've ever been so stressed over a show in my entire life. And this is all because the first five minutes of the episode were things that had already been released in the manga, but everything after that was totally new. We had no idea who was going to survive, who was going to die, what was going to happen. It was so terrifying and I ended up staying up till like 3am just to watch it. It's not like I would have been able to sleep anyway, but regardless, I think that they did such a good job of animating that last part. One thing that really irks me that I talk about on TikTok all the time is that people complain that the final episode of BSD had so many plot holes and loose ends, and it's like, well yeah, because the story isn't finished yet, and I think we just need to be patient and let them finish the story before we call it full of plot holes. It just, oh, it annoys me so much. My only complaint about the whole thing is that I just want Asagiri to kill someone so bad. Nobody dies in this show except for Odasaku, and that's so unfair. Does that mean I'm gonna like it when a character dies? Absolutely not, but I still want it to happen. <laughs> After I finished BSD, I knew that it was time for me to finally wrap up watching Attack on Titan. It was something that I've been putting off for a really long time because I've read the manga, I knew how it ended, and I knew it was going to hurt. I think they did a really amazing job and they really did the ending justice even if they spread it out for way too long that was kind of annoying i'm probably going to end up making a huge analysis video about attack on titan eventually but for now just know that it gets a gold star from me the most recent anime that i've finished is vinland saga i don't know why but i was not expecting to like it as much as i did i finished all of season one and two in the span of a week. I could not look away, I could not stop watching it. My friend who recommended it to me was shocked at how quickly I got through the whole thing. I really want to read the manga because I've seen snippets of it and the art style is really cool. I also love the concept. And Vinland Saga is a historical drama. It tells the real stories of Thorfinn who was a Viking and Canute who was one of the princes of Denmark. I don't even know how to explain it. I guess part of me knew that it was about Vikings and just went, oh, it's gonna be a classic, ah, oh, Viking show and not that interesting, but it really delved into the politics of everything and again, back with Asian shows just doing a really good job of making you attached to characters and care more about the characters than the plot. And the fact that season two was so completely different to season one, I loved both of them for totally different reasons, and I think that's really cool. Now onto animes that I am currently watching. First we have Hunter x Hunter, which is one of those classic animes that has hundreds of episodes. I'm pretty sure I have a hundred left, I'm not certain. It's kind of driving me nuts how long it is, but I really want to stick it out because I love Kurapika and I know that his story is really good. I'm trying to stick it out, I'm really trying, but it's so long. I'm also watching Link Click, which is technically a Donghua. The concept of this one is also really cool. It's about these two guys who have a talent of being able to look at a photo and delve into it to uncover a mystery or to change 
history, didn't mean for that to rhyme, but basically one of them delves and the other one tells him what he's supposed to do, what he's supposed to say, in order to make sure that they don't change too much history, because if they do, they'll totally alter the course of everything. I'm probably going to finish this one before the year is over, so if you want to count it as one that I've watched, then sure. And there are three animes that I'm watching weekly as the episodes come out. First is Heaven Official's Blessing. As I told you before, I'm reading the book. I'm reading the book because I finished season one and lost my mind. I need to know everything that happens in this story. I really love the animation style of the opening in season two especially. It's so beautiful. And this is another cultivation story by the same author who wrote MDZS, but this is about a god, so somebody who's already ascended, and a ghost. I'm also watching Spy Family season two, and I've already talked about it a little bit, so I won't go too deep. But I love Anya so much. She is my child. She's my daughter. And of course I'm watching Jujutsu Kaisen season two. The other day I had to put off watching one of the episodes because I knew what was going to happen. Again, this is a manga that I'm up to date on. It hurts so much. I don't know what it is, but the animators are making everything hurt so much worse. Things like a certain death that was only one panel in the manga went for five minutes somehow in the anime and that just broke me. I also briefly want to mention some of the animes that I rewatched parts of because these are ones that I love with my whole heart. First is Life Lessons with Udamichi on Nissan, which I really want to buy the manga for because I think the covers look really cool. But this follows the story of a group of actors who perform in a children's TV show and they have to be so bright and happy and positive on screen that the second the camera shut off they just drop and they're so exhausted and depressed. And initially it's really funny, but the more you watch, the more you realise that this is actually a little bit too realistic, you know? This is what adults are dealing with all the time. And I loved how, as the story went on, it felt like everyone was becoming a bit of a closer family. And they were starting to watch out for each other. I don't know. I've also rewatched the entirety of Bongo Stray Dogs season 1 and 2. It should not be surprising. I also rewatched Chainsaw Man at the beginning of the year with my sister, mainly because she hadn't watched it and I just finished catching up with the manga, so I wanted to go back with a new set of eyes. I rewatched bits of Jujutsu Kaisen season 1 again with my sister because she needs to watch it. If you're watching this right now, we need to finish watching it, please. And the Tokyo Summer Training arc in Haikyuu. If you know, you know that is the most comforting piece of media ever created. <laughs> and that brings us to the end of my 2023 media wrap up. My god, that went on for so long. I've been filming for nearly five hours. My eyes are starting to burn. This year was honestly so good for me in terms of media. I managed to get through so many amazing shows, movies, books, whatever. I'm looking forward to a couple of things being released next year, namely the new Haikyuu movie, the new season of Alice in Borderland. I really hope that the new volume of Given and the new BSD light novel will be released in English, but I don't have high hopes because these usually take quite a while to come out. I'm also really excited but also really scared about new Jujutsu Kaisen, Chainsaw Man and Bungo Stray Dogs chapters. It could be great, it could be terrible, and I'm not going to know until we get there. If you've made it this far, thank you so much for watching. I really hope that you've gotten some good recommendations from this list. I also hope that if you've seen the same media as I have, you think that my opinions on them are at least fair. Of course, one of the joys of media, one of the joys of fandom, is that everyone has a different opinion on everything, and that's what makes it so interesting. So if you have any recommendations or different ideas of the same thing, let me know in the comments. Give this video a like if you wanna, that would mean a lot to me. Subscribe if you wanna, that would also mean a lot to me. And I'll see you in the next one. Bye!